All right, good morning. Uh, today we have two lectures together back to back. Um, so it's going to be intense for both sides probably. Uh, the, the first lecture, so this lecture, is going to cover uh, the, the whole variety of receptors of neurotransmi neurotransmitters that we, that we find both in the central nervous system and outside. So we'll talk about the individual receptors, what they do, and we'll also talk about where in the brain specifically we can find these types of neurons that use these types of, new, uh, of uh, neurotransmitters. So we'll talk some, a little bit about the pathways in the brain that use these neurotransmitters. So that's the plan for this lecture. And in the next lecture, it's going to be much less packed with uh, new facts and terminology. It's going to be more about thinking because we will talk about how various ligands bind to receptors, how we can describe it mathematically, and how we can figure out what will happen if we, for example, use some medication, some drugs that interfere with binding of these neurotransmitters to receptors. So the second lecture is going to be more about thinking, not many facts. The first one, so this one, is going to be fairly packed with uh, new things. All right. Um, the main reason why we have this lecture about the receptors of neurotransmitters is that the effects of neurotransmitters, and generally speaking of signaling molecules, are really determined by the receptors that are present on the specific cell or the specific tissue. So with the majority of signaling molecules, especially in the central nervous system, we can't really say that a neurotransmitter has this kind of effect, or that if you have too much of this neurotransmitter, it's going to cause this. Because the actual effect depends on which receptors are present, because we will see that for one signaling molecule, for one neurotransmitter, we can have many different types of receptors that will cause many different types of effects. So that's one thing. We have many different receptors, and they will have different effects. The other reason why we can't just say, okay, if there's too much serotonin, this will happen, or if there's too little serotonin, this will happen, is that the brain is not, or, is not like uh, any other organ, like, for example, liver, where the majority of cells are just sitting there. I mean, of course, they are interconnected and they do communicate, but most of the time we can't say this part of the liver specializes in this and this part of the liver specializes in something else, okay? In the brain, that's different. So we have a lot of neural circuits and processors and coprocessors and etc., which have different functions in the brain or for our behavior or perception, etc., cetera, or regulation of other, other bodily functions. So an excess or a deficiency of a neurotransmitter in different parts of the brain will have different effects. Okay? So again, we can't say, okay, if you have too much dopamine, well, then the question should be, okay, too much dopamine where? Okay? Because it will have different effects elsewhere. Um, so in today's lecture, you will see that there is a huge variety of receptors and of effects. There are many different pathways that use neurotransmitters, these individual neurotransmitters, for different functions. And hopefully it will, uh, in addition to teaching you about all these different uh, types and effects, uh, it will also give you an idea that you have to be very specific when you talk about the nervous system and about what goes on there. Okay, so it's very different from hormones. Okay, with hormones, we often say, okay, if you have too much hormone, this will happen. With neurotransmitters, usually you can't really say that. Okay, even though people say it and in popular press or popular media, you hear, okay, not enough serotonin causes that. Okay, it, it doesn't work. You, you can't really say that. Good. In this course, you've heard about a lot of different types of receptors and a lot of different types of signaling cascades, which are started by these receptors. Now, in today's lecture, it will be relatively easy because for neurotransmitters, we only have two types of receptors. The first type are ionotropic receptors, so ligand-gated ion channels. We'll see a few of them, okay? So these are receptors where binding of the ligand opens an ion channel. So those are ionotropic receptors. 
And all the remaining receptors that we will talk about, apart from these ionotropic, are going to be metabotrop metabotropic receptors and specifically G-protein-coupled receptors. Okay? So, so the majority of receptors we will see today are G-protein-coupled receptors, which is not an accident because the majority of all the receptors in our body are G-protein-coupled receptors. It's by far the biggest family of receptors that we have. Okay? Um, mostly due to the fact that olfactory neurons, so the neurons that detect smells, okay, have G-protein coupled receptors as well. So those are signaling really or hormone or neurotransmitter receptors, but they're olfactory receptors. And we have hundreds of them. So this whole family is just massive, okay? Loads and loads of receptors. So today, ionotropic receptors, a few of them, but the majority are these heterotrimeric G-protein coupled receptors. So very briefly, how do G-protein coupled receptors work? What's the story there? Just to revise. <coughs> okay, like it binds to a receptor. Mm -hmm. There's a change of conformation. Excellent. So the G-protein is called heterotrimeric because there's three different subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so it's somewhere close by. Okay, attached to the membrane or something. Hmm? Effector. Well, the effector is at the very end of the story. Okay, so far we have bound a ligand. There was a conformational change in the receptor, and there is a G protein sub hanging around somewhere. So what happens then? It's not yet. Not yet. Okay, not just the alpha part, but the whole thing binds to the receptor, okay? Because the receptor has changed its conformation, so now it can bind the G protein, okay? The whole thing, okay? Excellent, so GDP is released from the alpha subunit and GTP comes in instead, which activates the whole thing, right? Then the alpha are disconnected. Okay, then the alpha subunit and the beta gamma dimer dissociate from each other. Okay, so the activated alpha, alpha subunit, which has dissociated from the trimer of the, of the G protein, then goes to an effector protein or to several of them and activates them or deactivates them. Okay, and depending on the type of the alpha subunit, we distinguish different types of G proteins which have different effector proteins. Okay, and we'll talk about that in once, once we get to the specifics. Now, one thing that you may or may not have covered is that the beta gamma dimer itself is also a signaling molecule, okay? And it will also bind to other effector proteins and will basically start other signaling cascades, okay? So oftentimes in textbooks, the whole focus is on the alpha subunit, but actually the beta gamma subunit is as important, and in some cases, and we'll see some today, is even more important than the alpha subunit for the effect, okay? So both parts of the G protein do have signaling functions, okay? So that may be a, something that you may not have heard before. If you have, that's great. All right, yeah, so this was a, just a quick revision of how G proteins work. All right, so let's now go to the first group of receptors, and these will be the adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic, which means that their natural lig ligands are adrenaline and noradrenaline. Okay, so those are receptors for adrenaline, noradrenaline, adrenergic receptors. For adrenergic receptors, we have two big groups, alpha receptors and beta receptors. And these are further subdivided into alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. Okay, so those are the, the five types of adrenergic receptors that we have. All of these receptors are G-protein coupled receptors, okay? All metabotropic, all G-protein coupled, but they are coupled with different types of alpha subunits and therefore they will have different effectors. The alpha-1 receptor is coupled to a GQ protein or G-alpha-Q. 
And the activation of this receptor and then the, the G protein will then cause what? What is the signaling cascade here? So the GQ, the G alpha Q activated, activates phospholipase C. Excellent. Phospholipase C. And phospholipase C will do what? Excellent. So it will cleave phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate yeah, to inositol trisphosphate plus diacetyl glycerol. Yeah? Okay, good. So this is exactly what happens. Now, what does IP3 and DAG, what do they do? So IP3 activates specific ion channels on the endoplasmic reticulum, opens them, and calcium is released from the endoplasmic reticulum. So this increases calcium levels, and all those things like muscle contraction or other things may happen, secretion, etc. Um, what about diacetylglycerol? Yeah, a subset of protein kinase C, so it will affect gene expression and other things in the, in the nucleus. Okay, and also elsewhere, it will phosphorylate a lot of different proteins. All right, good. So this is exactly what happens when we activate, when we bind noradrenaline to, uh, to alpha-1 uh, receptors. By the way, and I will repeat it again, the alpha receptors have a little bit higher, well, significantly higher affinity for noradrenaline and the beta, beta receptors have a higher affinity for adrenaline. So both noradrenaline and adrenaline will bind to both of them, okay? but noradrenaline activates these better, uh, and adrenaline activates these better, okay? just so we know. All right, uh, the, the um, alpha-1 receptors, we find them all over the place in the brain, in the central nervous system, uh, but we also find them in the periphery, outside of the central nervous system. And specifically, we find alpha-1 receptors on the smooth muscles of blood vessels. And there, alpha-1 receptors are responsible for vasoconstriction, for constricting blood vessels, in response to noradrenaline, okay? So this is one of the pathways, and we will talk about it more tomorrow. It's one of the pathways through which blood pressure is regulated, okay, by means of noradrenaline through alpha-1 receptors, causing muscle contraction because of this IP3 and calcium release. Okay, if you remember how smooth muscles are contracted, goes through this IP3, calcium, and then myosin light chain kinase and contraction, okay, basic constriction. Okay, we'll talk about those things more tomorrow. All right. Um, the alpha-2 receptors are linked to a GI protein, uh, or G alpha I subunit. Um, and this G alpha I subunit does what? What is the effector? Inhibition. Yeah, that's what the I stands for, but what does it inhibit? The Excellent. So it decreases the activity of adenylate cyclase. And therefore, so this would be activated, and therefore it decreases the amount of CAMP, cyclic AMP. Excellent. So that's the that's the cascade. Okay. Um, and as some people already started saying uh, when I wanted to hear the uh, the cascade, the alpha two receptor has a specific function in the central in the nervous system, and that is it's a presynaptic receptor. So the alpha two is actually on the presynaptic neuron. And one of its functions is to serve as a negative, negative feedback loop, as a sensor of how much noradrenaline has been released into the synapse. And this noradrenaline then, I mean, obviously it binds to postsynaptic receptors, but it also binds to this presynaptic receptor and basically tells the presynaptic neuron, okay, enough noradrenaline has been released, stop releasing it, okay? So it's a feedback inhibition loop. Again, tomorrow, when we look at some of the applications of this, we will see how we can influence it in order to yeah, do different things in the, in the brain. So the alpha-2 is primarily a presynaptic neuron, a regulatory, sorry, presynaptic receptor, primarily a regulatory receptor, um, 
and the um, the cascade is such. Yeah, inhibits analyte cyclase and inhibits decreases the amount of CMP. Right now, the beta receptors, all the beta receptors are all coupled to G alpha S. So that makes it a little bit easier. Okay, all G alpha S. What is the cascade for G alpha S? Okay, so we activate it activates adenylate cyclase and therefore it increases the concentration of CMP. And then CMP can do all sorts of other things. It can activate, for example, protein kinase A, which then phosphorylates all, all sorts of things. The cyclic nucleotides themselves, like CM, CMP, they can also directly bind, for example, to various ion channels and regulate their opening and closing okay, from the inside. Okay, from the inside of the cell. So lots of different, uh, lots of different functions, lots of different effects of CMP. So all three beta receptors go through um, alpha GS or G alpha S, and 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 this is the cascade. Now these three receptors, just to give you something to remember them by, maybe. Okay, uh, and again we'll see, we'll hear a little bit more about it tomorrow. Beta-1 receptor, apart from being in the nervous system, uh, is also present in the heart, in the cardiac muscle, and especially in the conductive tissue, in the conductive system. And there it is responsible for mediating the increase in heart rate and increase in the strength of contraction in response to catecholamines, to adrenaline, noradrenaline, okay? So beta-1, it is in the brain, okay? It's still in the brain. Uh, but it has, has this other location, and it's probably a little bit easier to remember it by that. Okay, that's beta 1. Beta 2 and beta 3 receptors are not found in the central nervous system, so they are only peripheral. Okay, we don't have them in the brain. These three we do, but these two we don't. Um, and beta 2 receptors are typically found on smooth muscles, both in blood vessels but also in the bronchi, in the lungs, okay? And there, the activation of beta-2 and the activation of G-alpha-S causes muscle relaxation. It causes the smooth muscle to relax, okay? So this increases heart rate, okay? And this causes vasodilation. So look, we have one receptor for, for adrenaline or adrenaline, which will cause vasoconstriction. And then we have another receptor for the same molecules that actually causes vasodilation, okay? So this is just an illustration of what I said in the beginning. It's not about the signaling molecule, what it does. It's really about the receptors. It goes down to the receptors and it will have different effects depending on which receptors are present. Now, you may think that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have in our body, in, on our smooth muscles, both the alpha receptors, which cause vasoconstriction, and the beta-2 receptors, which cause vasodilation, because these two things go against each other, right? Well, there is a logic to it, because some blood vessels will have primarily alpha-1 receptors, and other blood vessels, which are somewhere else, will have mostly beta-2 receptors. And the idea is that when adrenaline or adrenaline are released from the adrenal medulla in a situation of stress, okay, fight or flight reaction, okay, you have to start doing something there's danger about. Uh, what the body wants to do is to vasodilate, to increase the blood flow into some tissues, such as which tissues would you? Yeah, absolutely. So skeletal muscle, because you want to fight or you know run away or something like that. Other tissues where it might be a good idea to increase blood flow, the heart muscle, absolutely. So coronary arteries will be will be dilated, so that more blood flows through the uh, through the heart. Lungs, yeah, to some extent the lungs as well, yeah, absolutely. And also, obviously, we want to dilate the 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 bronchi, absolutely. Okay. And then on the other hand, in some other places of, in, in the body, we want to constrict the blood vessels. We don't really want a, a lot of blood flow if we are to fight or run away or something like that, such as? GIT. The GIT, absolutely. Uh, 
Hmm. Well, there will be a change in pupils, but not in their blood supply. Okay, but skin, for example, okay, so people in stress will be really pale because the, the, the blood vessels will constrict. Okay, so there's one signal, adrenaline, noradrenaline, it's released, okay, from the adrenal medulla, but it will have completely opposite effects depending on whether we're talking about blood vessels or some other smooth muscles that have beta 2 receptors or that they have alpha 1 receptors. Okay, it's just an illustration of what, what I said in the beginning. Um, the beta-3 receptor is found primarily on the adipose tissue and is responsible for starting lipolysis. So again, think about a stress reaction. You need to start running away. You want to get as many fatty acids so that your muscles have enough, uh, enough energy to do all sorts of, sorts of things. So beta-3 are these receptors that mediate this lipolysis caused by catecholamines, by adrenaline, noradrenaline, so adipose tissue. Um, you probably have heard about the enzyme hormone sensitive lipase. Yeah, okay. So it's sensitive to this. That's what makes it hormone sensitive. Okay, this is the hormone sensitivity. So it's activated by the increase in C CMP. Good. Now, I said that for each of these neurotransmitter systems, I will tell you a little bit about where in the brain you can find them. So let's see if I can draw a brain. Okay, something like that. It's not perfect, uh, but hopefully you, you get some idea where we are in the brain. Um, the, basically, the nerve cell bodies that produce all of these neurotransmitters that we're gonna talk about, apart from glutamate and GABA, are all found in the brain stem. So they are not in the big brain, okay, um, that we have, because that's all glutamate and GABA, okay. But the nerve cells which use all these uh, noradrenaline and dopamine and serotonin that we talk about are all somewhere in the older parts, evolutionary older parts of the brain, in the brain stem, okay. Primary, uh, primarily in the mesencephalon, but we'll, we'll see some other ones as well. And these nerve cells, which, which, produ which produce, or whose projections produce new, their neurotransmitters, then project the axons to other parts of the brain and influence the functioning of other parts of the brain that use other neurotransmitters, okay? So we will see projections in, into the cortex and, and elsewhere. Now, at this point, don't worry too much that you might not know these structures or you know they may have confusing names don't worry about it this is just a first exposure to these names and you will cover that in quite some detail next year in, in neuroanatomy okay so don't be scared that there will be a lot of weird names this is just to give you an idea of, of what we are talking about when we talk about these neurotransmitter systems so the uh, The groups of nerve cell bodies, um, they are actually, neuro, in neuroanatomy, they are called nuclei. So when we have a, a bunch of cell bodies in the brain, it's called a nucleus, okay? So they're called nuclei. And the nuclei that produce noradrenaline, um, adrenaline is not really produced very much in the brain, okay? It's mostly noradrenaline, or almost entirely noradrenaline. There might be a few ex exceptions, but mostly it's noradrenaline. So the nuclei that uh, produce noradrenaline are found at very, very low stages of the, um, of the brain. I mean, I'm going to kind of draw it somewhere here. So it's, it's basically at the end of the brain, beginning of the spinal cord, who could say. Okay, so somewhere between the mesencephalon or the pons and the medulla oblongata. Um, and one of the most prominent groups of neurons, of nuclei, which use uh, noradrenaline as its neurotransmitter, is called locus serulus. White for that. Okay. 
locus serulos, which means a bluish place. Okay, bluish, yeah, locus. So yeah, bluish place. You could put put it like that. And next year, when you start looking at brains, and you're going to see a, a cut up brain, you will see that at the bottom of the fourth ventricle, so there is a little ventricle here, okay, called the fourth ventricle. Uh, a ventricle, it's just a, a space with cerebrospinal fluid in it, okay? And underneath the fourth ventricle, so once you cut it open, you will see these little two bluish dots, and those are the, the two locus ceruli, there's one on each side, and they are bluish because the neurons are pigmented. They have melanin in them, so they're kind of darker color, and as you see it through the, uh, through the fourth ventricle, they look kind of blue. So hence the name, blue place, okay? And these neurons from the locus cerulos then project into all sorts of other areas in the brain, including the cortex, including hypothalamus, and all of the other parts of the brain. And one of the main functions of these noradrenaline producing neurons is to be a part of a system called reticular ascending activation system. Reticular ascending activation system. And that's a system which uses noradrenaline to basically keep the rest of the brain awake. Okay, so it's a system that pumps noradrenaline into the cortex and subcortical areas and basically keeps us attentive and awake. Okay, if there is damage to these old centers using, using uh, noradrenaline to, to wake things up, people fall into coma and they can't wake up. Okay, because the, the system to do it is missing. That's just one function of these neurons. They also do other things. They regulate blood pressure and all sorts of other things in the hypothalamus, some hormone secretions, etc. So it's not the only thing that they do. Okay? Um, they also regulate emotions to some extent, some instinctual reactions, okay? lots of other things. Uh, but the, the, the thing to remember maybe is this reticular ascending uh, activation system because it's very important for other things. So there are also other nuclei, but if you just remember the local cellulose, that's, that's good enough. Good. Any questions about adrenergic receptors and what they do? No? Is this um, reticular ascending system, uh, what, what happens in sleep? In sleep, it's inhibited. Okay, through other circuits. Okay, so there's a regulation that basically uh, inhibits it a little bit. Okay, but if you damage it, then you can't wake up. Basically, it's not exactly sleep. It's more like coma. Okay, because sleep is a highly regulated process where you you know we have different phases, etc. So yeah, it will be inhibited. <coughs> Sorry, it will be inhibited. Of course, in the uh, just one second. Um, next year, we're going to have a, a, a lecture on. Uh, the effect of various substances on these on these systems, meaning mostly I illegal substances, and we will we will talk about stimulants. And some of these stimulants activate this reticular activation system, and that's that's how they stimulate and make you awake, so you don't fall asleep, etc. Other question. <coughs> Yeah, as I said, there are some other nuclei because I don't want to talk about all of them, and they're, but they're close by. But so locus cerulose is the one that, yeah, at this point is enough. Good. The next neurotransmitter system that we talk about, that we're going to talk about is dopamine, dopaminergic. Dopaminergic. For dopamine, 
We know about five different subtypes of receptors, which are denoted D1 to D5. Uh, but I will only talk about D1 and D2, about the first two receptors. And the reason why I'm going to mention just these two is that the majority of dopamine receptors in the brain are either D1 or D2. Okay? The other ones are much less abundant. They're still important and they do serve functions, but let's just talk about D1 and D2 at this point. The D1 receptor is, so all these receptors are G-protein coupled receptors, and D1 is connected to G-alpha-S, and D2 is connected to the G-alpha-I. So very broadly speaking, we could say, okay, this one is more a stimulatory receptor, and this one is more an inhibitory uh, receptor, okay? Just be aware that this may not work so easily, okay? So GS can have also inhibitory functions, and GI, well, probably does not, yeah, I don't think of an example where GI would be stimulatory, but just be careful, it doesn't always work 100%, okay? That GS is always stimulatory and GI is always in inhibitory. So we have D1 and D2 uh, receptors, and uh, these receptors are part of several different pathways in the brain where they mediate several different functions. Now for dopamine, really, so with, with um, the adrenergic system, I told you about one nucleus and some projections, and okay, all, they do all these different functions. For dopamine, I will tell you about four different pathways because each of them has very specific functions and when we change the neurotransmission in one of them, it will cause very different effects than if we change the neurotransmission in a different pathway, okay? So for dopamine, okay, the receptors are relatively simple, okay? Two receptors, G-protein coupled, easy. But let's now talk about the, uh, the dopaminergic pathways. So dopaminergic nuclei, so the groups of neurons that use these neurotransmitters, are located somewhere around here. Okay. It's not perfect, okay? Anatomists would probably say it's rubbish, okay, but approximately. Um, and there are two big groups of neurons in the mesencephalon. So again, we are in the brainstem, we are in the older parts of the brain, but we've moved up a little bit, okay, closer to the, uh, the big brain. Um, so there are two little nuclei and which produce, which produce uh, dopamine. The first one is called a VTA, which stands for ventral tegmental area. Next year, once you start in your anatomy, it will make sense because it's in the ventral tegmentum, okay? But at this point, it's just a name, VTA. And the other one is called substantia nigra. Which once again just says it's a black substance. Okay, old anatomist name. So this was a blue place and this is a black substance. Okay, it stands for ventral tegmental area. Okay. It's in the ventral tegmentum, ventral tegmentum area. Area, yeah. Uh, again, don't worry about it now because you don't know the rest of the anatomy, so you know it, it would be confusing, but it will make sense later on. So these are the main nuclei for dopamine. There are some other ones as well, okay? But these are the main ones for uh, at least for our purposes. So what are the pathways that start from these nuclei, and what are the functions? So the first pathway is called the mesolimbic pathway. Now, why is it called mesolimbic? Meso just says that it starts in the mesencephalon. Okay, so that's meso. And limbic means that it projects into the limbic system. Now, maybe some of you have heard, maybe others haven't. The limbic system is a connection of nerve cells. It's a circuit, or rather connection of circuits in the brain. 
composed of several different uh, structures in the brain, which serves as a system for emotions and instinctual reactions, okay? Emotional, instinctual, quick reactions, gauging of danger, uh, of pleasure, and other things, okay? So it's this not super rational, we could say, part of the brain, but I mean, those are labels that probably don't really work in neuroscience. Um, but limbic system is responsible for pleasure, fear, uh, aggression, uh, sexual attraction, and all these things, okay? So the mesolimbic pathway uses dopamine from the VTA. So it starts in the VTA. It projects into the limbic system somewhere around here. Okay, I'm not gonna go into details about limbic system, but yeah, project somewhere there. Um, and regulates by means of secreting dopamine, it regulates the functions of the limbic system. This mesolimbic pathway between VTA and the limbic system is part of the reward system or reward pathway, which is a neural circuit that basically gives us pleasure or reward for behaviors that we have been programmed or we learned to be good for us. Okay, so it is a system that that provides the the feeling of the the feeling of you know having eaten and feeling okay this was nice I've eaten something nice okay uh, a pleasure of sex and sexual attraction and uh, and all these things so all these things that give us kind of reward okay activate this pathway okay I'm not gonna um, reduce all of uh, human behavior and all of human experience onto some neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. Okay, it's not just about dopamine. Um, but this pathway, when you actually measure the activation of the pathway, it will be activated for all sorts of behaviors that give us pleasure and reward. Okay? It is also activated in addiction. So in addicted people, okay, this pathway will be activated when they get their drug or you know, whatever game or you know, they may, may be addicted to all sorts of things. So this mesolimbic pathway is part of this reward system. Uh, very important. The other pathway, which also starts from the VTA, is called the mesocortical pathway. As the name suggests, it starts from the VTA and projects into the cortex. The main projections are into the frontal lobes, okay? So it really projects mainly into the frontal lobes, not so much to like the occipital lobes or some, somewhere there. Um, and this pathway is responsible for regulating, so mesolimbic was about emotions, aggression, pleasure, and all these things. The mesocortical pathway regulates very high level executive cognitive functions. One of the things that is regulated by this pathway is our ability to distinguish between important things and unimportant things. Okay, this is a big simplification, but I will use it. So at any instant, we are bombarded with billions of different sensory information. Okay, that, you know, at this point, I, I Theoretically, I, could, I should feel my t-shirt and the temperature and the air moving around and um, all your movements and all these things. But my brain only selects the things that it feels are important and the other ones I don't really perceive. Okay? I don't really see them, I don't feel them because the brain filters them out. Okay? Part of this filtering at a very high level occurs in the cortex. A lot of the filtering occurs like on the way. Okay? Some of the filtering and some of the decisions of what is important happens in the frontal, frontal cortex, and it is at least in part regulated by this mesocortical projection. Okay? And if there are disorders of that, people may start to have tendency to pick things and give them meaning which other people would not notice and would not give them any meaning. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow uh, in the last lecture in this, in this mini block. So that's the meso mesocortical pathway. The third super important pathway, dopaminergic pathway, is called nigro 
striatal. It starts in the substantia nigra and it projects into a structure called the striatum. Uh, the striatum is part of a bigger group of circuits called the basal ganglia. And those are big groups of neurons which are hidden inside the, the big brain. Okay? So the big brain, the telencephalon, there is a cortex, which is a gray matter. Underneath is the white matter, which are the axons of all these cells from the cortex. And underneath that, there are these huge nuclei called the basal ganglia, which are hidden inside behind my eyes. Okay? And they have many different functions, but at least in part, they are big computers which compute our movements. So imagine that the cortex is telling me, okay, go to the wall and pick up a coat. Okay, so the cortex doesn't really need to compute how to do it. Okay, it just says, do that. And sends a signal to the basal ganglia and the basal ganglia basically compute what my body has to do in order to do this. Okay, how to move my weight around, which muscles need to be started, which muscles need to be inhibited, and all these things. Okay, so basal ganglia, they have also other functions, but these motor functions are super important because without them, we wouldn't be able to move. We wouldn't be able to, to do any coordinated movements. Okay? So those are the basal ganglia, and the nigrostriatal pathway is part of this, and it regulates, among other things, our ability to initiate movement. So basically, when it is switched on, again, I'm hugely simplifying, okay? But when it's switched on, this nigrostriatal pathway, it makes it easier for us to actually, to actually start moving, okay? When it's not functioning properly, this initiation of movement is very difficult and people have problem moving around. And it's the nigrostriatal pathway which is damaged in Parkinson's disease. And the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, not all of them, but at least some of them, are caused by this hypokinetic disorder because the patients cannot properly start the movement, so they are really moving around very slowly. The facial muscles are inhibited. They can't, they can't, it's difficult for them to initiate the movement, so they have a face as if a mask because it's not, it's not really moving very much. And it is caused by damage to the neurons in the substantia nigra, and therefore this nigrostriatal pathway is not working properly. Okay, so that's the third path, pathway, dopaminergic pathway. The fourth and last one I will tell you about, there are other ones, okay, but the fourth and last for us is called tuberoinfundibular. Tuberoinfundibular, weird name. This pathway is very short. So all the other pathways that we talked about were pretty long. Yeah, I didn't draw the, uh, the nigrostriatal, so the nigrostriatal will be somewhere here, okay, thereabouts. The tuberoinfundibular pathway starts in the hypothalamus, so somewhere around here. Okay, there's a hypothalamus. And there is one structure which I didn't, didn't draw before, but it is the pituitary gland, which starts from the hypothalamus. Yeah, the pituitary, the hypophysis. And the tuberoinfundibular pathway starts in the hypothalamus and projects into the pituitary gland. And it regulates the secretion of hormones, of some hormones, from the pituitary gland. So it's a very short pathway. The main hormone which is regulated by this dopaminergic pathway is prolactin, as you said correctly. And when you learned about prolactin and you heard that there was this prolactin inhibiting hormone, which basically keeps a break on the prolactin secretion, that's actually dopamine. And it's dopamine which is secreted in this tuberoinfundibular pathway. 
Okay, so it's a short neural pathway that just projects and blocks the secretion. When it's activated, it blocks the secretion of prolactin. Once again, this should hopefully illustrate for you how difficult it is to say, okay, what happens if I have too much dopamine? Well, all sorts of things, right? It depends where you have too much dopamine or too little dopamine. And these effects can, just can, be, can vary all the way from too high prolactin to inability to move or um, to start having hallucinations or delusions or something like that. Okay, all these things will be caused by disruption of dopamine, but it happens, it depends on where, how, how much, etc. Good. Any questions about dopamine? <laughs> no questions. Okay. Um, let's take a four minute break and we will continue. We'll continue. Yep. Continue. So the next, the next neurotransmitter we will talk about is serotonin. And as we mentioned in the uh, in lecture about synthesis, we said that serotonin is usually denoted by the abbreviation 5-HT, which stands for? <laughs> tryptamine, 5-hydroxytryptamine, very good, 5-HT. Um, and this is also the abbreviation used to denote the receptors. So we have several different families of serotonin receptors, 5-HT1, uh, all the way to at least 5-HT7, and I just read the day before yesterday that maybe there is a 5-HT8 receptor has been discovered. So there are many, many, many receptors, but I will only talk today about three of them, the first three, 5-HT1, 5-HT2, and 5-HT3. These, as I said, are actually families of receptors. So we have subtypes of these subtypes. So there is 5-HT1A, 5-HT1B, we have 5-HT2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, etc. Okay, but let's not worry about it now. Okay, I will only use one of these subtypes to tell you something about that, but it's enough just to know the families. Okay, 5-HT3 receptors is not a family, there's just one there. Um, so, the first two receptors, and actually all of the other ones, with the exception of 5-HT3, are G-protein coupled receptors. And that is with GI and GQ. And all the other ones are also G-protein coupled. The only exception is 5-HT3 receptor, which is an ionotropic receptor. So it's an ion channel, a ligand-gated ion channel, and it is a cation channel. So when it opens, when, when we open a cation channel, what, what happens? It will cause depolarization. And how will it cause depolarization? Which ions will flow into the cell? Yeah, so it's going to be mostly sodium flowing into the cell. Of course, at the same time, potassium will be flowing out of the cell. But the flow of sodium will be higher because the concentration, is different, is concentration difference is higher and also there is the, uh, uh, the voltage across the membrane. So more sodium will flow in than potassium out. And therefore, we will get, as you say correctly, we will get depolarization. So 5-HT3 is a cation channel and will cause direct depolarization of the postsynaptic um, post neuron. Um, the um, These receptors, are responsible for a lot of functions of serotonin, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about their functions once we once we start looking at the pathways. Um, 5-HT1 receptor is kind of the general neuronal serotonin <coughs> receptor, so we find it all over the place. Okay, as as I said, there are many subtypes, so it's it's a large group of receptors, and as you can see, it is mostly inhibitory. It's going to have mostly inhibitory effects on the neuron once it's activated. 
The family of 5-HT2, on the other hand, is going to be mostly stimulatory because it goes through GQ, GLFQ, calcium, etc. So we'll mostly call stimulatory effects. And the, the way to remember 5-HT2 receptors is through their one, one of the subtypes, which is 5-HT2A receptor, which is the main receptor to which hallucinogens, psychedelics, bind and activate it. Okay, I mean, they're partial agonists, etc. But anyway, they bind to 5-HT2A. So all hallucinogens, all psychedelics like LSD, uh, mescaline, uh, um, DMT, etc., bind to this 5-HT2A receptor and cause their effect through this receptor. Okay, so this receptor is enough, or activating this receptor is enough to cause quite florid, colorful hallucinations, visual hallucinations. So, yeah, that's how you remember 5-HT2 receptors. 5-HT3 receptors is a, an exception, so they are, it's an ion channel. Actually, genetically speaking, or structurally speaking, 5-HT3 receptors are very close to acetylcholine receptors, which we're going to talk about next, okay? So they kind of, they're unrelated to this, but they still bind and, and are activated through serotonin. These 5-HT3 receptors have, again, a few functions, including memory and other things, but they are responsible for what we call central vomiting. What does it mean? Uh, there are two basic ways to cause vomiting in a human body. Either they could be peripheral stimuli coming from the GIT, okay, including just putting your finger in your, in, in, in your throat. Okay? So these peripheral stimuli will say there's something wrong in the gastrointestinal tract, we need to start vomiting. So that's peripheral vomiting. But then there's this, there's this central vomiting, which basically is a mechanism through which the brain monitors the composition of the blood. And when it finds out, that the composition of the blood, there's something wrong with the blood, it will start this central vomiting. So the brain is saying there's something wrong with the blood, okay, let's get rid of whatever you've just eaten. How does it work? Well, there is a group of neurons somewhere around here in the brain, which is called area postrema. which just translates as a, the, fur, the farthest away area, okay? Which is the farthest away because it's at the very end of the brain, okay? We're almost in the spinal cord. It's called area postrema. Um, and area postrema is one of a few places in the brain where there is no blood-brain barrier. So the neurons of the area postrema are basically directly in contact, not directly with the blood, but directly with the endothelium and then the blood. So there is no blood-brain barrier between them, which means that they are exposed to the composition of the blood and they can react when there is something toxic or some, something that shouldn't be there. Part of the sensing mechanism is mediated by 5-HT3 receptors. So they are responsible, they are needed, their activation is needed for the central vomiting. And this is the central vomiting is usually caused by poisoning, Okay, alcohol poisoning, for example, okay, will cause the central vomiting. But for clinical medicine, the most important application of this is in cancer chemotherapy. In cancer chemotherapy, we're giving patients very toxic things to try to kill their cancer cells, okay? And the area postrion detects it in the blood and causes really, really an intractable, horrible vomiting. So that's why 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, and we will talk about it a little bit more uh, tomorrow, 5-HT3 antagonists were developed, which can block this central vomiting, and they have really led a revolution in chemotherapy, because previously the chemotherapy had to be stopped, because pe people were vomiting so much that it just, it just, they couldn't continue with the treatment. With the advent of these 5-HT3 um, uh, receptor antagonists, people can really endure much higher doses and much longer therapy because we can, we can attenuate the vomiting. Okay, so it's just an interesting mechanism through 5-HT3. Yep. So the 
H two three it's it's cause vomiting and if we use antagonist it's inhibit. Yes, but it doesn't cause vomiting, it mediates the signal. Okay? So the area apple streamer cells are detecting what is going on, okay, in part through these 5 h 3 receptors. So if we block them, we can stop vomiting, this central vomiting. Okay? Not peripheral, so they can still vomit if they put the finger in. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, where in the brain do we find neurons which use serotonin, and how do they project? Well. Again, I said that all these neurotransmitters have nuclei which are somewhere around here. So the serotonin nuclei are clustered somewhere around here. They are called, anatomically, they are called nuclei raphae. There are a few of them. There are several different groups. And they project into the limbic system, into the cortex, they also project down a little bit. Lots of different projections for serotonin. So I talked about one function, which is the central vomiting. Okay, but serotonin is very important for the regulating of memory formation. And as you may have heard, serotonin also plays a role in regulating um, affective, affective state. So basically emotions. Okay, how you how you feel, how you relate to, to the world, sociability, okay, how you approach people, if you keep your distance or if you approach them. A lot of these things are regulated by these serotonergic projections into both the cortex and the limbic system. Okay? So many, many, many different functions of serotonin. The reason why I'm talking about all these different functions of serotonin and also the other neurotransmitters is that if you read in the popular press, serotonin is hormone of happiness or something like that. Okay, it's bullshit, right? Um, it's also, you know, a hormone of vomiting. Uh, it does all sorts of things, depending on where you look uh, and, and which, which neural circuits are really um, involved, okay? Good. Moving on. Uh, l yep. Yeah, but you don't have blood-brain barrier here where it matters, okay? I th think they maybe even, maybe they even cross the blood-brain barrier. I'm not 100% sure, sure about that. I think maybe they do, but the area okay. apostrium is exposed to the, to the blood. Okay, All right. Um, the, the last of these minor neurotransmitters, well, not quite the last, but, well, anyway. Ne another one of these minor neurotransmitters is histamine. Now, histamine is not a neurotransmitter that we often talk about because its functions are not really super well understood and not well studied. But the reason to know about histamine and its receptors is that antihistamines, so medications that work against, that block histamine receptors, are really widely used. Okay? Probably many of you have taken them. So knowing about these receptors, and then tomorrow we will talk a little bit about these antihistamines, what they do, uh, can come useful. Uh, there are three histamine receptors, H1, H2, and H3. They're all G-protein coupled with different G proteins. And they do have different functions. So the H1 receptor is found in the brain on many neurons and it probably, uh, one of its functions of this, of this histamine, histamine system is the regulation of sleep and you know, wakefulness. So activation of histaminergic system in the brain will cause you uh, to, to wake up and blocking the, uh, the histamine system will, will uh, make you go to sleep, okay? It probably also regulates appetite and feeding behavior, okay? So lots of different functions for this H1 receptor. Now those antihistamines that you take are H1 receptor blockers, okay? But, and that's spoiler for tomorrow, 
Most of the modern ones do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so they will not affect the brain. They will only work in the periphery to keep the allergy symptoms at bay, but they will not cross into the brain to cause sleepiness or overfeeding, etc. Okay? The previous generation, the old generation antihistamines would cause that, and now we actually use them for these other purposes. But I'll talk more about it tomorrow. H2 receptors are also found to some extent in the brain, but their pharmacological importance is that they are in the stomach, and there they are used to regulate the production of acid in the stomach. So basically, histamine stimulates the production of, of acid in the, in, the, in the gastric juice, um, and, and this happens through H3, H2 receptors. H3 receptors are these negative feedback, these presynaptic receptors, these you know, autoreceptors, um, as we talked about in alpha-2 receptors, so it, the H3 receptors are a similar thing. Good. What we have left are the big three, um, which is going to be acetylcholine, and then glutamate and GABA, okay? And then we talk a little bit about opioid receptors, but that's, uh, that's gonna be pretty quick. So, let's talk about acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine receptors, so when I say it's one of the big three, well, acetylcholine is not a big neurotransmitter in the brain, in the central nervous system. But as you all know, it's massive in the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system uses acetylcholine a lot. And one of the important locations where we use acetylcholine for transmission of signal is, is the muscle. And more specifically, what is the structure where it happens? The neuromuscular junction. Excellent. So in the neuromuscular junction, the signal is only transmitted through acetylcholine. We have lots of muscles, lots of neuromuscular junctions, therefore acetylcholine is quite important. It's also important for the autonomous nervous system, for regulating glands, etc. Acetylcholine has two big groups of receptors. The first one are ionotropic, they're ion channels, and they are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Nicotinic because their specific activator is nicotine. So nicotine will only activate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but it will not activate the other group, which are called muscarinic receptors, because they will be activated by muscarine, which is a compound found in mushrooms in toadstools. Okay? So muscarine will activate muscarinic receptors, and nicotine will activate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So these are ionotropic, these are cation channels, okay, ligand-gated cation channels. These are all G-protein coupled. So these are metabotropic. I will tell you a little bit more about, about these. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, as I said, are cation channels, ligand-gated, so acetylcholine comes in, opens channel, and causes depolarization of the membrane. This is something that we saw already in the neuromuscular junction and in other places, okay? So this, these are the receptors that mediate that. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptors have two subtypes. Well, actually, they have about 10 subtypes, uh, but we can kind of put them into two groups. One group of subtypes are called neuronal. And as the name suggests, they are present in neurons. And the other subtype is called muscular. And those are the ones that we find in, in the neuromuscular junction. And they are distinct. And we can have different medications that work on these, but don't work, work on these, or they work on these and don't work on these. So those are sub-subtypes, okay? Fairly important for some pharmacological reasons, okay? In fact, they are all composed of many different sub 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 types, but that's not important at this point. The muscarinic receptors, as I said, are all metabotropic. They are all G protein coupled receptors. There are about five of them, I think, five different subtypes. I will just tell you about the first three. Uh, the um, M1 is coupled with GQ, 
M2 with GI, M3 with GQ. It actually goes like QI, 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 QI. But it's enough for you to know about these, these first three. The M1 receptor is primarily found in neurons. Okay, so we find them on neurons. And as you can see, it's going to be mostly activating receptor because there's GQ. M2 receptor, to some extent, is also in neurons. But the way to remember M2 receptor is that it's an important receptor in the cardiac muscle. Remember, when we talk about adrenergic receptors, we said that beta-1 receptor is the one through which the increase in heart rate is mediated through uh, noradrenaline. M2 receptor is the opposite receptor. So it's the receptor that causes a decrease in heart rate when it's needed, okay? Which is mediated by acetylcholine. So there is a uh, neural, uh, a neuronal release of acetylcholine into the, into the heart, which decreases the heart rate so that these two things can be counteracted. The interesting thing is, and this is something that I already kind of announced in the beginning, the main part of the effect of, M of M2 receptor is not through the alpha subunit of the G protein, but through the beta gamma dimer. So the beta gamma dimer is, as I said, it, it has its own signaling functions. Here, what beta gamma does, it binds to potassium channels in the brain, uh, sorry, in the, in the heart, binds to potassium channels and opens them, which causes hyperpolarization and therefore, it decreases the contractions of the muscle and also the, uh, the amount of signals that go into the muscle so that it contracts, okay? So this is the opposite number of beta-1 receptor. We have beta-1, M2, and these work against each other. And it's interesting because it's here, it's mainly through the beta-gamma dimer. Again, beta-gamma dimer is important in all cells, okay? It's not like this is an exception, but here we think that this is the main mechanism while in some other cells, maybe the beta gamma has its functions, but they're not as important as the alpha one, as the, as the functions of the alpha. Right. I said that acetylcholine is more important in the peripheral nervous system, but we do have acetylcholine in the brain as well. Um, one notable nucleus, which has neurons which then use uh, acetylcholine, is a nucleus which is located somewhere here. It's called the basal nucleus. And it projects mostly into the cortex. Okay, so it's not in the cortex, it's hidden underneath the big brain, but it projects into the cortex and some cortical substructures. One of the functions of the basal nucleus is to regulate the formation of memory. And if it is damaged, if the neurons are dying, are damaged, we can start losing memory. And it is something that we observed in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so the Alzheimer's disease, even though it's caused by other things, okay, and maybe we don't quite know what, what it causes, but one of the symptoms is that these cholinergic neurons in the brain are dying out, and this causes us, or the patients, to lose their memories and being unable, unable to recall them. Okay? So the basal nucleus, cholinergic projections into the brain are important for this. Okay? And we, uh, it's generally acetylcholine in the brain. Okay? It's not just M2 receptors. Okay? There are also the nicotinic receptor. So all these receptors are in the brain. We can find them in the brain. And this is just to show where we can find acetylcholine or cholinergic, in, uh, cholinergic neurons in the brain, okay? the basal nucleus. Acetylcholine is also important for the basal ganglia. Remember, those are these computers to compute the movement. Okay? So in Parkinson's, et cetera, acetylcholine is also an important player there. Okay? But I'm not going to draw it there because it would, be, it would become quite confusing. Good. Any questions about acetylcholine? Cholinergic receptors? All right. Let's get to glutamate and GABA. We're almost there. Okay. 
glutamate receptors, glutamatergic receptors, can also be divided, similar to acetylcholine, can be divided into two groups, ionotropic and metabotropic. The ionotropic glutamateergic receptors exist in three flavors. They are named after their specific agonists, so after chemicals that only activate the subtype, not the other ones. So they have weird names, which are usually abbreviations. The first one is called NMDA receptor, which stands for N-methyl-diaspartate, which is the specific agonist. You don't need to know that. Okay. The other subtype is called AMPA, stands for aminomethyl isoxazole hydroxypropionic acid, or something like that. And the third one are called kinate receptors after kinic acid, which is the specific agonist. So all three are ionotropic. They're ion channels. They're cation channels. Uh, so when they open, they allow mostly sodium. With the exception of NMDA receptors, which when they open, they actually allow a lot of calcium to go in as well. Okay, So most of the ionotropic receptors that we talked about allow mostly sodium in, but NMDA also allow calcium to go in, which is quite important because calcium as a second messenger will cause many different effects in the, in the cells. So these three subtypes are all ionotropic. Then we have metabotropic receptors, and they are all called metabotropic glutamate receptors, metabotropic glutamate receptors, and they have different numbers, and there are loads of them. Since glutamate is the main neurotransmitter in the brain, in the cortex, okay, I'm not going to tell you about its functions because it basically does everything in the brain, right? Most neurons are using glutamate, so it just does everything. So there are no specific functions for glutamate, like we had for, for the, the minor neurotransmitters. So here are loads of functions. But I will just single out this NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor is special. Okay? Most of the other receptors that we have, they basically just bind a ligand and open. Okay, that's it. Okay, not, not, not much sophistication in there. Okay, I'm simplifying a little bit. There's a little bit, of a little bit of sophistication there. But the NMDA receptors are highly sophisticated. In order for the NMDA receptor to open, it is not enough for the receptor to just bind glutamate. If an NMDA receptor just binds glutamate, nothing happens. For NMDA receptor, to open, it needs to bind glutamate. It also needs to bind glycine, a molecule of glycine. And the third condition is that the membrane has to be depolarized. So imagine that we have a NMDA receptor in the membrane, a glutamate comes in, but the receptor is still closed. Okay, So a glycine has to come in, the receptor is still closed. But then, if something else causes depolarization of the membrane, actually this something else are usually the AMPA receptors, which are just close by. Okay, So the glutamate will activate them first. They will cause a depolarization. And this depolarization, what it does to this receptor, it dislodges an ion of magnesium. So magnesium ion is sitting in the pore of the NMDA receptor. And the depolarization basically causes it to leave the pore so that the pore can open. You can imagine that this magnesium is pulled in by the negative charges when the membrane is polarized. So the, the magnesium is kind of held there as a stopper by the electrostatic interaction. Okay? And as the membrane depolarizes, the magnesium flows away, glycine, glutamate, and then the, um, the receptor opens. 
Now, you're probably going to ask, why is it so complicated? Okay, why not just have a simple receptor? Well, because this receptor actually functions as a little computer, okay, as a little transistor or something, because it integrates several different inputs. Okay, it integrates the input glutamate has been released, glycine has been released, and at the same time, the membrane has been depolarized. So it is on its own a little computer which computes whether all conditions have been fulfilled. And this is one of the reasons why NMDA receptors are super important for the formation of memories. Okay, because it, it works in a process which is called long-term potentiation, which is a process through which neurons connect with each other and stabilize the connections into memory circuits. And for that, an MDA receptor is absolutely crucial. Okay, through this very complicated functioning because it kind of integrates things together. So very, very important receptor. It's not like the other ones aren't important, but this one is super important. One thing to say about metabotropic glutamate uh, receptors, next year when we talk about senses, we will talk about several of these metabotropic glutamate uh, receptors. Some of them are in the retina, okay, very important functions in the retina, and some of them are on our tongues because a, one subtype of metabotropic glutamatergic receptor uh, detects the fifth taste, umami, Okay, which is the taste of glutamate. So that's one of the subtypes of, of, glutamate, of metabotropic glutamatergic receptors. We'll hear about that next year. Any questions about glutamate? If not, let's move to its counterpart, to glutamate's counterpart, which is GABA. For GABA, it is a little bit easier because we basically have two receptors plus one, but the third receptor is not super important. So we have GABA A receptors and GABA B receptors. Receptor, sorry. GABA A and GABA B. The GABA A receptor is also ionotropic, it's an ion channel, but this time, since it is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, what kind of ion channel is it going to be? Probably. Huh? It's an ion channel. It has to be an anion channel, because cation channels will cause depolarization. It has to be an ion channel. And which anion is it going to be? Probably chloride. Absolutely. So it is a chloride channel, ligand-gated chloride channel. And when it opens, when it's activated, chloride in most situations will flow into the cell and will cause hyperpolarization. And this is what inhibits the, the function of the target cell, of the cell that contains this, uh, uh, this receptor. GABA-A receptors, and we will talk about it a little bit tomorrow, are super important pharmacologically because a lot of different things bind to GABA-A receptors and will cause inhibition of the central nervous system. A lot of things that are also abused or used recreational, let's put it that way, work through GABA A receptor. GABA B receptor is a G protein coupled receptor with a G alpha I. Finally, a pretty good time. Finally, opioid receptors. So you have heard, and we talked about it a little bit in the, in the synthesis, um, we do have receptors for opiates, for morphine, heroin, and all these things. But of course, these receptors did not evolve for heroin and morphine. They evolved for endogenous uh, opioids, such as beta endorphin and all the other things. That's what we discussed. And we have three subtypes of opioid receptors, which are called mu, delta, and kappa. So they're denoted by Greek letters, mu, delta, and kappa. These subtypes of receptors uh, have different functions. Okay, So some of them are more responsible for suppressing pain. Some of them are more responsible for feeling good. Okay, Some of them cause more um, um, uh, 
addiction or they can they can lead their activation can lead to the formation of addiction okay unfortunately it has not really been possible yet to devise a an opiate that would really work well against pain but would not have the other effects okay so because their functions overlap so so far that's not been possible all three opioid receptors are g protein coupled receptors with a gi protein uh, gl5 so they are mostly inhibitory inhibitory receptors. Where do we find opioid nuclei in the brain? Uh, the picture is getting pretty crowded. So uh, there, is, there are groups of neurons somewhere around here in the brain which produce opioids. And these opioids project both into the, the big brain, but also they project into the spinal cord to block pain, which may be coming from the spinal cord. So they project both ways. Okay? This structure is called periaqueductal gray matter. This is just for your information if you're interested, but um, it's not that important now. peri ductal gray. We need to remember the hmm? We need to remember No, you don't need to remember any of the anatomical things at all, okay? If you remember them, great, because next year you're going to find them useful, okay? But at this point, this is just for your information where they are. You don't really need to know any of these, okay? So the periaqueductal gray, it's a gray matter, so it's bodies of cells which are along the aqueduct. The aqueduct is a tube that carries the cerebrospinal fluid, so it's called the aqueduct. And it's around the aqueduct we have neurons which contain, um, which produce opioids. The very last neurotransmitter signaling molecule that I want to just, because you already know that, uh, you know the receptor is nitric oxide. What is the receptor for nitric oxide? Yeah, it's called soluble guanylate cyclase. It's a soluble guanylate cyclase. So it's not a membrane protein. It's inside the cytoplasm and it will convert GTP to CGMP when it's activated, okay? Nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter, okay? It actually has this advantage in a way that it's such a small molecule that it can also cause retrograde neurotransmission. So normal neurotransmission in a synapse always goes from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron because that's the only way it works. Only one neuron has vesicles and only one neuron has receptors, right? Nitric oxide can be formed in the postsynaptic neuron and can go in the opposite direction and influence the presynaptic neuron. Well, the nitric oxide synthases are the, uh, the, the enzymes that produce it, okay? That, that is true. But nitric oxide, it can diffuse into the surrounding area and can influence other neurons in the opposite direction. So that's just an interesting thing. All right, questions? The presynaptic neuron. Well, I mean, there are a few theories of what it could be doing. So basically, it could actually work with this long-term potentiation. It could be a feedback for the presynaptic neuron telling it, OK, we've received the signal. Now you can change your other things. OK, so it, it helps communicating between the, the neurons in the opposite direction. But I don't think the details have been really worked out yet. Good. That's it for now, and I will see you in a bit with the next lecture. Okay.